So you guys are saying, why motels, right? Well, you must have some interest because you're here and I appreciate that. But I'll tell you about my passion and then you can decide if there's anything that intrigues you about it. So the first thing is, uh, they're just a story of wandering and traveling and adventure. And when these motels first got started, it was in response to this tremendous American spirit of just, let's go explore. And to me, that captures a time and a place in no other way that um, I can really describe. Now, as a kid, I'm of a certain age, so I would be in the 50s and 60s with my parents driving along, and you know, the whole thing was watch for the next motel sign, and they were these cool neon signs, and oh, dad, look, that one has a swimming pool, and can we stop there? There's a playground or whatever. And so it evokes, again, this nostalgia, I think, for a time when everything was just, uh, there was no internet, so you didn't know how far it was to the next town, or what motels were available, or what TripAdvisor thought of it. So then as a historian, because I'm a lawyer, I love cataloging things, and Susan and I have come at this the same way. We want to catalog all the old motels in the state, whether they are still standing or not. That's an exhaustive process, but I think it's a really intriguing one. And so cataloging is my thing, and I've cataloged things like the downtown historic apartment buildings of the early 20th century, or the uh, original uh, adobe bricks of Panguitch in the 1870s and 80s. So those are the things that interest me. Now, this also has a couple of bonuses, though. Motels are family businesses, and I love the story of family business, and mom and pops especially. And then roads. Anyone who's interested in Utah history loves roads and road development, and how did roads get us from one place to the other. And of course, these are all completely based on being on the roadside. So hopefully that gives you a couple different ways to approach motels. I have some other ideas as we go along, but those are the ways that I got interested in them. Uh, so I, I'm going to start out by taking you on a little road trip. Susan and I do this as one of our history methods. And what I hope to show you today is a varying approach to the times of the different businesses. And then when there's still one today, I'll try and show it to you. Now there's about 120 still existing in the state, so I can't show you all of them. I just tried to choose a few, but hopefully that will be a good uh, sampling and it'll get you more intrigued. Susan and I are doing a full panel at the Utah State History Conference in September, a panel discussion. She's going to do one part, I'm going to do another part. We're going to have a couple other things. So this is just to whet your appetite. Um, we have an upcoming book. Of course, you know, that's always what a historian says, right? I'm writing a book, and uh, we've been working on it for a long time, but I thought it would tell you kind of the overview. What we want to do is document and explore the motels. Now, if they're not still there, we basically have to go with postcards and directories and things, but if they're still there, we're driving to them, we're interviewing, we're photographing, we're trying to do as much as we can to document them. We start with the early beginnings in 1900s. As soon as there's a car, there's a motel. But back then it was called an auto camp. Then I take you into the tourist courts, which are the U-shaped courts. And then the family business aspect of it, it's really in response to the first tourism surge after the parks, the national parks get designated. That's all before World War II. And motels have sprung up in response to that. And then there's a huge post-World War II boom. And that's really the heyday of the modern mom-and-pop motel in Utah. And of course, family vacations figure into that, and it's lots of imagination in that period. And then sadly, the decline of motels with the two killers, interstates, which bypass a lot of the towns, and chains, which are much more predictable for the traveler and, I guess, more economical in some ways. But the good news is Susan and I have found a reinvention going on with mom and pops, and we'll talk about that. That's so kind of the overview of what our, our story is. So here's a picture of one of the very first cabins. I told you, you can see the old car there. As soon as these cars started going on long road trips, there was no place for them. And the hotels didn't really work because in a hotel you had to park out front and then go up in and you were dusty from the road and you had to make a nice appearance in a lobby and uh, people really wanted to get out of their car and get in the door. 
And so that's where these cabin ideas came from. These were in Washington, Utah, which is, you know, on its way to nowhere. But I love this photograph. It really captures it. Now, there was also one in Provo. It was called the Riverside Tourist Park. This one's long gone, but got the great postcard. And so you can see, again, the cabin idea where they can pull right up. They have their own independence. And you might not think of that as a precursor to a roadside motel, but it really was the congregate lodging. So then things started to really take off. I love this photograph. I know I'm kind of skipping forward to the 50s. This is a Dorothea Lane photograph. But this is coming when the road used to come from Santa Clara, Highway 91 from Vegas to St. George. And this is right before you turn in on Bluff in St. George. And so just the great advertising, this completely captures the excitement of here come a bunch of motels. I wanted to just tell you a little bit about our research because you might say, well, is this a scholarly thing or is this just a hobby? So Susan is the scholar and I am the hobbyist. But uh, here's the, some of the things we do. We have an amazing collection of our, our old postcards, she and I, and we still collect all the time. There's some you can't get, so we're always in search of the Twin Oaks Motel in St. George, for example. And some didn't have postcards, but we have tons of them, so that's great, because they not only have the postcard picture, but they have information. We also have just gone through all the phone books and all the city directories as many years as we can during our time period, which we hold rigid to. We don't go past the early 60s. Uh, we interview owners if they're still around. A lot of these families have died off, which is sad, but I've tried to get as many as I can. We've been at it for seven years, so we've got a lot. We do road trips, which is just an excuse for us. And uh, newspapers have tons of good advertising and announcements when they were built or when they opened. And travel guides, they would publish, you know, the AAA travel guide. Duncan Hines was an early travel guide. The motel associations, like the Friendship Inn, uh, they will tell you information, and then you can always go to the regular sources like the maps. But I thought that would give you an idea of how we get the information. Um, I just want to talk about postcards for a second, because here's a great example of what we can learn from a postcard. This is the Millen Motel in uh, St. George, which was actually owned by my great aunt. And so she built it as a second motel. I'll show you a picture of their first motel in a second. But the top left there, and that one is actually the original. So this is a linen postcard, if you know the difference. And so that dates back to really 1946. Then here is where it starts to get modernized. And you can see the sprucing up. It still doesn't have a pool, but um, better sign. The old sign is gone. And then the final version of it, it's long gone now. But the final version has a lot more stuff. The pool, it's been painted pink. It's got this really flashy sign. And, um, you know, St. George went through that period in the 50s where they added palm trees to everything and <laughs> tried to imitate Phoenix. But what it tells me, I mean, it tells me so many things, but it tells me don't just look at the Millen Motel. It could be called the Millen Motel, the Millen Motor Court, the Dixie Palms Motel. Some of these have gone through six or eight names. So you can't limit yourself. You have to keep searching a lot by address and by town. But I feel like a postcard is a real evocative reminder. So I'll start out with auto courts. Now what the cool part about this is they built garages right in the motel. And there's only a few of these left. And we've tried to identify all that are still in existence in Utah. These are both in Beaver, strangely enough. This group right here is built uh, from all sorts of weird things. It's called the Eagle Roost from Quonset huts that came from Topaz. It, they took different building materials. They would bring different rooms uh, and put them all together in a big row and then built garages in between and then this hideous stucco on the front and these really interesting Indian head medallions. So this is still there. You can drive by it. Get off the freeway and look at it. It's very interesting. So uh, I love that he has kept the garages in place. That really adds a lot to me. The South Pine is apartments now, and so they don't want garages, but you can see where one used to be. That's on the south end of Beaver. But whenever Susan and I find an auto court, we're delighted because they're mostly filled in and obliterated now. This one's long gone, but it was the Mission Auto Court in Price, and you can see the garages are these cool arches 
the cars were parked in front of them. And how cool would that be to just be able to drive your car into the garage, get out, go into your room, and not worry about the snow? I love the character of that one. Tom's Deluxe Cottages came from a friend of mine who had a relative that was involved with Tom's Deluxe Cottages in Penguin, again, long gone, but look how great the garages are represented. This building, they went to some trouble. It wasn't just a cinder block row. They really went with the whole cottage motif. And I love this postcard because you can see the sign right there. And when something like this is obliterated, it's just so fun to be able to see what it did look like. Um, so just taking you up to the modern time, if you want to drive down State Street tonight, you'll see Zion's is still there, Zion's Motel. It's um, just ahead of 21st South. There'll be three motels of my era that I love. Now, don't get your hopes up. It is not going to look like this anymore. <laughs> but it did have garages. You won't see any remnant. But it still has a historic sign, which I love. It doesn't look like this. I'll show you. It looks like this nowadays. So they've gone over the brick, they've stuccoed a lot of the building, and now it's just the most generic looking motel you can imagine. But it's still there, I give them credit, they haven't knocked it down. And um, a lot of those along State Street are used for low income housing or transition housing, which I am not against. I know people are like, oh, do you feel bad it's not still a motel? Susan and I always get asked, do you stay in these? <laughs> We're like, sometimes. <laughs> but we do stand outside and admire them, OK? But the one thing you can still see right here is that little arch and that little arched window. I don't know if you remember that from the postcard, but see how it was there? Still there. Now, there is another motel on State Street that looks a lot like that, and that is uh, Alta. So keep going. This one's almost the 21st South on the left as you're going south. Look at the garages on that, though. They're pristine. They didn't even try and cover them up. Unfortunately, people are living in them when I took this picture. But uh, still left the little fake you know, British timbering on the, on the gables and such. So that one's actually in pretty good shape. All right, so that's auto courts. Like I said, whenever we find those with the garages, even a remnant, we really get excited because we think this is from the earliest of the iterations of motels. So the next thing that happened was gas stations got combined with hotels, service stations. And so this is an example. Like I told you, the Millen Motor Court. This was the first one that my Aunt Edith Millen built in St. George, and it was called the Colonial Motor Court. And they had a completely independent person running the service station in front. And then the court, what makes it a court is usually the U-shape. And there's no pools or anything back in these days. It's very much a friendly little family thing. So usually what we find in those, in those motor courts and tourist courts is either cottage, uh, mission, like Spanish style, or um, kind of a modern with really like brick and glass block windows. Those are really the big styles for it. Every once in a while, you'll find an outlier. Like in St. George, there was the Carolina Pines. And you're like, in St. George, Utah, really? They had planted pine trees everywhere. Um, so a couple of other examples of tourist courts that are still there. So the top shows you the postcard for the Hales Motel. It was built by a guy named Jockey Hale. And he had already operated the Liberty Hotel in St. George, if any of you are familiar with old time St. George. But the hotels, like I said, weren't getting the business anymore. So they decided, well, we'll put up one of these tourist courts and maybe we'll get some business. So he put this up across the street from the Liberty Hotel and it's still there. So it's very cool uh, for, to us geeks that it was still there. Um, the Whitworths own it. And the Whitworths were a, a really prominent family in the early motel days. They started in Las Vegas, but they have a, still have a Whitwer in Whitworth Travel Inn in St. George. And they own the property next to this, which is the Coral Hills, if you're familiar with that. The Coral Hills, I, it doesn't really fit in my time period. It's a little bit more mid-60s. But it's beautiful because it was designed by Edward Anderson, who's a well-known LDS architect. So if you're down there, look at this, because it's from the early days. And then look at the Coral Hills right next to it. So you, sometimes people say, what do they look like inside? I have a little bit of the inside, 
when Susan and I went on our road trip last spring, we, you know, insisted on going in every room. I wouldn't show you every room, but I am showing you some things that were beautiful. And so that's an original light fixture that's over the uh, mirror in the bathroom, and then the light uh, plate, and then that tile, which was everywhere. Another thing I love when you go inside of them, of course they have the original woodwork, but they have, a lot of them are two room suites, and so you see a lot of the setup, and then in the office people live there. So you see their houses, and their living rooms, and their bedrooms, and how they slept there, and greeted the guests. Um, another one that we found, this was a total surprise to us, this is in Salina, but it's called the Ranch Motel, and it is like a time capsule. I mean, the screen doors are a little bit more modern, but everything else is original. You can see the, um, the light fixtures outside, all of these awnings. Everything came from really just after World War II, and it was kind of fun to just see one that, I mean, it's used as apartments now, but it really hadn't been altered. They built another building in front of it, and there's no good sign left, but it's a really evocative motel of the tourist court era. So if you're in Salina, check that one out. Um, so the Capitol Motel here in Salt Lake, Roger called me a while back, and he's like, did you hear they're tearing it down? And I ran right down and got, got photographs. They're actually not tearing it down. I talked to the owner, but eventually they will. They're using it as low-income housing right now. And, uh, I love the sign. The Capitol Motel is a cool sign. So that's one of my, can you see the little Capitol building thing, the little dome? And this looks a lot like that detail we saw on the Zions Motel. So one of the things in our book you'll be able to read about is these different architectural styles. They came from something called the Tourist Court Journal which was a national publication that gave people different ideas for what their tourist courts could look like. So it's not a lot of innovation. Um, when I did my article for about the St. George Motels, I was able to get about 17 or 18 craftsmen's names in St. George that built all the motels because they were the plasters and they were the stone guys and they were the tile guys. And I just love thinking about that. You know, they could have done a much simpler motel. This brick, I think, is quite interesting. So drive by the Capitol. I did go inside. I talked my way in and got pictures of this tile, which was all original. <laughs> I don't know about the color schemes. You can make your own decision about that. But the guy that took me in, who was like the security guard for the owner, he's like, yeah, and then there's this really ugly tile. And I said, oh, I love it. It's great. Because I know it's original, and some of the other things weren't. But the things that they change out, and then the things that they leave, are always very interesting to us. And so we've at least documented this if they tear it down. All right, so now we get to the heyday, the real exciting uh, boom time, and I chose this photograph of Jack and Leo because, first of all, they're from St. George, they're brothers, they are captured by Dorothea Lang here during her infamous uh, Life magazine series on St. George in Tokerville, and they're just beaming, I think, with the confidence of the age and the feeling that this is all going to be in their hands. And um, they're standing out in front of the Twin Oaks, which they built, which is long gone. But they also built places in Kanab and in Panguitch and in Cedar. They were really tycoons of their era, whether they looked like it or not. And they lasted through the whole era. Like, they owned motels throughout uh, the 50s and 60s. Jack built the Sands Motel, which is still there, one of my favorites. It's still the greatest sign in the state. And... Um, so I give him credit for that, although it's unimaginative architecturally. It's cinder block with nothing over it. Uh, but Jack and Leo just to me say, you know, we got the world by the tail. And so what was happening after World War II was everybody was back on the road after the deprivations of the war. And St. George was on the way to everywhere. It was on the way to California. It was on the way to, you know, Chicago if you were going up that way. Air travel was not affordable. So St. George just blossomed in that era, and they ended up having 28 motels that we can document, um, but probably more. And for a town of, you know, two or 3,000 at the time, that is an amazing feat. 
And one of the things I love about it, because I have roots down there, is a lot of these were just mom and pops who decided, yeah, we run cattle lot on the Arizona Strip, but we also are going to run a motel. <laughs> or, you know, we've always had like the Liberty Hotel, but now we need to reinvent ourselves because no one's staying in hotels anymore. So it's just kind of an interesting time and place. And um, we've been able to document a lot of these are still standing in the state of this era. The tourist courts and the auto courts much less common. So uh, I could go on for hours, but I tried to just choose a few that I love. Um, the El Peso is one of my faves. And it's still there, guys, but it doesn't look like this. But uh, when Susan and I first met each other, she said, oh, yeah, and then there's that really weird one in St. George called the El Paseo. <laughs> and I said, no, it's a joke. His, his name was Andy Pace, and he had been in, he was an FBI agent in Arizona, and he thought it was so cool that he could make it sound like El Peso, but use his name in the title. Now, if you have to explain it that much, it's not that cool, Andy. But he was a, another one of the real tycoons. He, I give him credit, and you could debate me on this, for that uh, slogan where the summer sun spends the winter. That was the St. George slogan until the modern day. And they actually did have a deal where if you came down there and you stayed, and I think there was more than three days where no sun shone, then you get your room for free. And that was Andy's brainchild. So he had two properties. He had the El Peso and then the one I started with on my title, which was the Rugged West. And the Rugged West was right there where Ancestor Square is in St. George, if you know where that is, like the pasta factory or that. Um, that was where the Rugged West was, long gone. But luckily for us, the El Peso is still there. Now, some of the cool things about this, the sign, obviously, that is a marquee Las Vegas type sign. And I would kill to know where that is. I can't give up the idea that it's in some junkyard in St. George somewhere, just rusting, and I'll find it one day. So big. But um, Andy only owned it for a few years. But the thing he did that was so commendable is he used real craftsmen for the building. So all that stone is cut stone by craftsmen. And it's local sandstone. And it's white. And the vision he had was this ranch motel. So you've got the ranch railings across the, the balconies. It's used right now as apartments. But it actually is kept up pretty well. I love the stone. I love the wood. I love the Spanish tile roof, which is original. Still got some original light fixtures. Um, there's a lot of things about this to love. And if you are down there, be sure and check it out. Because when you think about this postcard, you'll see it in a new light. Uh, and I know I've talked to Andy's son quite a bit. He's been in one of my interviews. His name's Brooks Pace. And he has fond memories of working here as a boy. Because remember, these are all mom and pops. Andy and his kids lived right there in that place where the window is. And so Brooks's job was to oil the mats along all of those balconies. They had mats. And he had to get up and oil them all because in the desert sun they would crack. And then he had to uh, go over to get the ice, which was there was no ice machines back then. And so he would have to carry ice to all the rooms. Anyway, he had fond memories, but not fond enough to keep the Rugged West standing. <laughs> I was like, oh, you got to keep it up, Brooks. And he said, no, it was too junky. But um, I just really love this one. And I love the story of the Paces and what they were able to accomplish uh, for St. George. I feel like they really did give it its modern life as a Southwest retreat, you know, that kind of a mode. Now another one, this one's in Richfield, it's called the Mount Air Motel. So the top is the postcard, and then the bottom is when we saw it just a few months ago. It's, it's closed, which I'm sad about, but at least the mid-century modern lines are still there. And it was fun to be able to see it and match it to the postcard. So uh, if you drive through Richfield now, I hope it's still there, but I did capture it on film if it's not. And then the Spiking Tourist Lodge. Anyone drive by this on State Street? Hopefully you've noticed this cool sign. This is another one. You notice all of this era are more the two-story. So that's what makes it a lodge motel instead of just a tourist court. And um, so glad these guys have left the light. And they have, still have neon on that. And also just 
So does anyone know the story of how this got its name? The, the family was named Spiking. And then they thought it was a clever play on the golden spike. So they designed it as this. Um, again, I'm not sure other people get the joke, but good effort on their part. <laughs> now Moab, the Apache, this is just a legend. John Wayne supposedly stayed there. I hope it's true. Uh, it's again a two-story. You can see the lodge effect here with the balconies. But the sign is my favorite part. And in Moab, if you're driving down the main street, there's a couple arrow signs. Don't miss those. They're all, all uh, of a piece with this probably uh, culturally inappropriate sign. But it's still just so great. It's that post-war, you know, we're going to take what's unique about our town and exploit it and make it uh, visual to you. So Susan and I both really like this one. And then just a few other teasers from things we saw around the state. The Country Paradise, anyone know where that one is? It's in Gunnison, you would not guess. I certainly didn't. We just happened upon it. Um, but when you're driving through Gunnison, if you're going up north, just look on the right and it's not operating anymore, but it has this incredible neon on the brick, which I couldn't talk the guy into lighting up for my photograph. The sign's gone, though. Oh, it is? is it? I mean, oh, no, there, there is still a sign. I, I can actually show you a picture. There's a sign that's even in worse shape than that. Um, so it wasn't readable. But I said to the guy, his, like, I think it was his mother-in-law that owned it originally, so he was very uninterested. He's like, yeah, it's an eyesore. We're trying to decide what to do with it. And I said, please don't ever get rid of that sign. But it also has an amazing old barber pole on the uh, building, one of those old red and white ones. And so I tried to say to him, does it have a barber shop in it? He said, yeah, originally it featured a barber shop as part of the motel, only about six or eight units. But really nicely constructed red brick and very solid. It's one of those things where, you know, if it looked worse, he'd be able to take it down, but I think he feels guilty. This one is the um, ranch, the canyon in, in Panguitch. And Panguitch is really just a hotbed of the preserved motels, for those of you that are hanging around Bryce. So I love the, the rock on this and all the original doors or arch like that, which gives it a lot of cool character. This spinning wheel sign, anyone recognize that? You guys got to get off I-15 and drive through these towns. It only takes six or eight more minutes and it's just so much more colorful. This is in Fillmore. Susan insists this is a handmade sign, maybe. What do you guys think? Doesn't look like Young Electric Sign Company, but it does have neon on it. And so she thinks that they actually made this part of it. And this is like, you know, metal. Um, but it was originally called the Robinson Motel, and the Robinson building is a very old building. It's from, the, I think, the 1860s, and it was built with some of the rock that comes from the state capitol in Fillmore. So you'll recognize it. But then the Robinsons built a tourist court like everybody did, or a motel, and they had to have a different name. So it was the spinning wheel. I don't think that's in relation to anything in particular in Fillmore, but just trying to get business, trying to be colorful. So here's the Sands, another one of the modern era motels. It's got a two-story and a one-story part. If you're in St. George, it's been stuccoed over. Be still, my heart. That's just so sad to me. It was originally cinder, and then it was painted green. If you ever saw it in its heyday, it was green, like a kind of a, you know, that industrial school green color that was in some of the 50s schools. And then they had fake redwood stain on the wood to make it look like redwood. And I thought it was a thing of beauty. Now it's kind of just a blah stucco thing. It looks a lot more modern. But thank goodness they have not ruined the sign. And this has been a hard thing for the owner. Susan and I interviewed him last year, and he said that they're constantly telling him that they're going to put like trees in the park strip that block the sign, or that you know if he has a bulb out, they're going to write him up for it. And he says it costs a lot, some, some number of thousands to run a year, that sign. But I just said to him, take up a collection because it is so beautiful. So remember Jack Holt. This is his creation, that picture I showed you. I love this about the sign swim pool, not swimming pool. <laughs> 
and uh, be our guest. The guy that ran the sands for years and years, his name is Alma Truman, and I was able to interview him for my article. He and his wife lived there with their two kids, and he said that um, the sands in Las Vegas was always giving him a hard time, because this was kind of a cheat name off the sands in Las Vegas, which was a much more illustrious uh, building. But back in that day, I guess you could, they had a sands in several towns. They had one in Kanab and one in Panguitch, too. So they were members of the Friendship Inn, which was kind of like the AAA, but just, you know, kind of like the Best Western. It was just a, an association that they promoted each other. And when Alma told me about it, he said it was the most fun job he ever had because you meet all these different people. Everyone has a weird story. One of the things in St. George that they did, if you can believe it, is they called them day sleepers. So they would get the room clean, and then the person would come from across the desert, from LA, and they would, you know, it would have taken them six or eight hours in those days, no air conditioning. They'd rent the room just to sleep for the day, get up at four and drive at night to Salt Lake. So they could actually rent the room twice in one 24-hour period. <laughs> Now St. George guys were, were onto this, and so, yeah, they had day sleepers and night sleepers, and they all had to kind of make their way out so they wouldn't cross each other, but it was innovative, and they did make a lot of money. He said, Alma said there was never, from May 1st until uh, deer hunting season, at the end of October, there was never a vacancy. That was just, and all of, if they all, down that boulevard, they all kind of referred to each other until the town was full. So I'm glad that it's still there. So now I'm going to tell you the sad part of the story, which is the chains come in. The travel lodge was one of the biggest ones. It came in St. George, it came in Provo, it came in Salt Lake. Didn't come to a lot of the smaller towns, but um, you know, it was just much more predictable. The people knew it from driving in other states. It was kind of the new slick thing. And it just drove a lot of them out of business. There wasn't enough business to go around even before the interstates passed them by, the chains were dominant. And now you can see the evidence of it. The you know, Super 8 and the Comfort Inn and the Holiday Express and all that kind of stuff. We are very disdainful of that, but I'm sure in 50 years someone will be making a study of all those, right? And telling you how cool they are. So this is the fun part to me, is there's a reinvention going on. And I just want to talk about this for a minute. Um, the Quail Park Lodge is in Kanab. So those two pictures, this is the sign, and then this is the building itself. They have totally updated it into this vintage, retro, mid-century, modern thing going on. They're around the pool, they have this wrought iron that has bubbles on it, and they have uh, bikes that their guests can ride around town on for free, you know, just little touches like that that make it feel really inviting and updated, but not uh, modern, it's really kind of a throwback vintage interpretation, and I give them lots of credit. I think they're doing a good job. The Blue Pine, um, full disclosure, I'm related to the people that own it, but it's in Panguitch, Church's Blue Pine, and this is the original uh, court from the 1940s, and they originally had started as the Blue Pine Hotel, which was a big, huge three story building. But then when no one wanted to stay in the hotel anymore, they built the motel. And the Blue Pine has a great sign still. And I interviewed the current owner, her name's Cheryl, and she was telling me that the neatest thing that has happened just in her time there, she's been there 20 years, I think. She said, you know, the first few years, so that would have been the late 90s, early 2000s, she was just had to be at the motel in this office, you know, 18 hours a day. <laughs> And she lives right next door in an attached house, but still she said, you know, people would drive through, they'd stop, they'd go in and see what your room rate was, maybe they'd want to see a room. If you've been to Penguin, you know all the rooms are the same vintage, so there's not going to be any, unless you go over to Ruby's Inn, you're not going to get anything modern. And then, you know, sometimes they'd go down the road and come back, and then they'd rent, and then finally when you got all your rooms rented, you could go to bed. Well, nowadays, she said, right now, she is completely rented for the whole summer because of the internet booking. And she says it's changed her life and it's so happy because she even said, 
I save, a, don't tell anyone, but I save a couple rooms some nights just so I can rent them again. Because, you know, it's like, why do you sit in the office if everyone's already got all their arrangements made? <clears throat> but for a small family business like hers, the internet has really made a big difference. And it's very exciting to them because they don't have to staff up or do anything more. She said her main job is to keep the reviews monitored on TripAdvisor in those groups so that people don't trash them. But, you know, whatever the people review them on and they care about, like, well, we wish there were, you know, iPhone plugins in the room, then they put iPhone plugins in the room. Not, it's not a big capital expense that, to reinvent these motels. And uh, a lot of her visitors are from Europe and they're going to the national parks. I asked her about that and she said she's had to learn, you know, a little bit of German and a little bit of Spanish and a little bit just so she can communicate. She said tons of people from Asia and that is usually bus tours, but they will book and they um, they just feel like it's kind of reinvigorated the whole model and I had never really thought about it until I talked to her in detail, so I was excited about that. Another good example is the Delano in Beaver, and I put the uh, lady and her daughter here that were in the office. So Susan and I stopped and talked to her for a couple hours. I love that she has the office sign still. It's neon. But it's a mid-century. It's not a quaint one or anything. It was probably early 50s, she thought. But she didn't. it wasn't her family's business or anything. Her family business is some sort of flooring business in Beaver. But she said, I just wanted another job, so I thought, I'll buy the motel and we'll work it out. And so she's done the same thing as Cheryl in Penguin. She's kind of got her family helping her. It's not a big labor cost. You know, they had to buy a few extra washers and dryers to do all the laundry. But she has left the original sign, which I love her for. And then these uh, parking places where you can park underneath are kind of reminiscent of the old garage mod. And so she was just super energized, and I said to her, well, and we went in her rooms, and they were all redone. They're very nice, and she's best Western and everything. And I said, wow, this is a really pretty cool furniture. And she said, yeah, the deal is, if you're at the highest level of the rankings on the best Western list, you have to replace your furniture every three years. Isn't that ridiculous, even though it's not wrecked? So she said, this has been such a boon for all of us mom and pops because the big chains just put this in there. There's like a motel wholesale furniture business and they can all upgrade and have really nice furniture and it's pretty much not that banged up. So anyway, I give her kudos for the reinvention there. and I think it's a great model because she has other sources of income in her family, but yet she wants to contribute to the community. She has a little... Uh, trailer court behind if you're, you know, kind of a KOA style camper. Anyway, very fun to talk to her and her daughter. And then, uh, Sun and Sand, this is in Kanab. Again, thank you for not taking down the sign. But you can see the postcard is on the top with that cool office with the rounded windows. And then this is just recently when we visited it. They've still got it there. And same kind of thing, you know, they're just trying to modernize and be with it. Kanab is where that Quail Park one is, so there's a lot of funky things going on with bright colors and trendy things. Um, and I am pleased because I guess Kanab or Penguin is one of those markets where the economics don't justify a ton of Holiday Inn Expresses. It's right on the cusp but they still have a lot of need for lodging because they're in the beautiful Intermountain West. So. It's exciting to me to see them staying in business. And um, before I go to the signs, I just want to talk about the Indian American ownership for a minute. So this is Susan's area of study. But uh, during our interviews with the owners, I think we calculated something like 60% um, of the owners we interviewed were people who had come from India either one generation back or this generation. A lot of them do, yeah. And Susan's very familiar with that because she's researched them in Phoenix and, and Las Vegas and she knows a lot more. I, I'm not the authority on it, but I'll just tell you a couple of in interesting anecdotes. So we, what our usual method is when we stop is we just go in and talk to them at the front desk, right? And so we're just like, hey, who owns it? What do you guys, how long have you been in business? How, what's your business like? And a lot of those people, English is a second language and so 
that is challenging, but they are very excited to be helping you. And so there's a, a fun to it. And then we ask them about, you know, what they like about the job. They love meeting people. They love, uh, you know, being able to take care of people's needs and interests. And when we taught the guy that owns the Sands Motel in St. George, the guy who maintains that sign, uh, he's a Patel, and he was telling us, so he and his wife came in early 1990s, their kids were little, they raised their kids in that motel, the doctor, the son's a doctor, the daughter's a lawyer, you know, this is the whole American dream reinventing itself, and he's, he still lives there, he's not going anywhere, but guess what? He owns a motel on every off-ramp on I-15 in Utah. And he was just so proud of that. And I thought, whoa, that is an interesting goal to have. And so a lot of those aren't the vintage motels that I'm interested in. But um, if Susan were here, I think she'd explain to you they have really interesting, unique financing methods that aren't about U.S. banks. And they're about family money. And so they can do these acquisitions. And the biggest challenge I saw for him was fitting into the community. Even though he's been in St. George for more than 20 years, there's still an issue. It was even much more pronounced in Panguitch. Uh, the people that own the Mariana Inn in Panguitch, uh, it's the Desai family. Same kind of story. Uh, Hershad Desai and his wife came and they, I kept saying, why did you want to be in the motel business? And they said, well, you know, he was an engineer and she was a school teacher, but they wanted to do something where their kids could work with them. And they saw the business in, in Panguitch being sold out every single summer and it's good rates. But fitting into a tiny little community of 1,100 people when that has been your life experience. So we could write a whole chapter in our book about that. And I do think it would be... Um, really interesting in just the terms that one of the reasons Utahns got into the motel business <clears throat> was to reinvent their towns. Because if you think of the economics, you know, the pioneers had come, then the second generation had come. They had started these towns that had no business being where they were because they weren't there for a natural resource. They were there because Brigham Young said, I want a town every 50 miles. So these towns are dying at the turn of the century. And there's no agriculture base to support the increase in population. So then when they see a motel opportunity, it really is, I mean, my father-in-law who grew up in Panguitch says it's really the mercantile class versus the agricultural class in those towns. And the ones that opted to go to the mercantile instead of, you know, continuing with the cattle grazing, there is a little tension even still. And then the move-ins, and you've got a real, a real interesting stew going on. So... <clears throat> Hopefully more to come on that. I think we're going to talk about the reinvention in several different ways. We're going to talk about it for the economics, the impact of the internet, the impact of the immigrant labor force. There's a lot of different fun things. But the cool thing to me as a historian is the motels aren't going away anytime soon. Now maybe my favorite ones have gone away, <laughs> but some of the ones that are still there aren't leaving. So I wanted to end with a few pictures of these vintage signs because if you can't find any other way to be interested in motels, you have to be interested in these signs, right? This takes nothing. I just want you to enjoy the visuals of these signs. So does anyone know where this one is? State Street, yeah, past 21st South. It's on the right if you're going south. Check it out. They light it up at night still. Susan has a really good picture of it illuminated. And it's beautiful. Uh, motel, not so much. And so <laughs> when I've got pictures over here of my favorite signs, uh, and you can look at them on your way out. But people do say to me, why don't you take pictures of the buildings? And I do, but they aren't the visual that the signs are to me. So this is a Temple City Motel. That's a beautiful one from Bryce Canyon Motel in Panguitch. And so Panguitch, like I said, Susan's convinced that it is the the motel town that Bernard DeVoto was referring to because it's just so many cool old motels and they're really untouched because the Ruby's Inn kind of took the motives away from the chains and old Ruby's Inn over at Bryce. So now it's just the town and they're needed but they can't really be reinvented and so 
Thank you. They've all kept their signs and they light them most nights and it's just beautiful, especially if you're there during the Hot Air Balloon Festival because at night they light up all the balloons down Main Street and then all the motel signs are lit. Anyway, Dixie Paul Motel. This is the sign that's on that Hales Motel that I showed you earlier. It's been through so many names. It was even the Western Jayhawk at one point. Some guy from Kansas owned it. But it is now the Dixie Palm. Now, if you were really paying attention, you saw my Millen Motel. That was actually called the Dixie Palm. In, and they stole the name, Hales did, when the Millen closed. And they put the sign up over at Hales. So you really have to be an aficionado to know why that one's called the Dixie Palm. But I love this part of the sign house, not about vacancies. Um, Canyon Lodge, that's another one from Panguitch. Hatch has this one. It used to be called Bryce Zion Inn, but now it's just Bryce. You guys know Hatch is a little bit south of Panguitch. Um, so I, I calculate there's about 35 of these two die for signs around the state. And I have a plan if somebody wants to take on the project. Okay, Orderville has that beautiful parkway sign. If you get down that way. Sleepy Lagoon Motel. I wish I had time to show you the pictures of what that looks like now, but if you do what I ask and you drive through Beaver instead of staying on the freeway, you will see the Sleepy Lagoon at the very end of town. And it does have a Sleepy Lagoon. And all the trees around it are dead. And all the doors are off the motel. And you can go right in and take a look at what the wallpaper used to look like. But you've got to love that sign. I mean, that sign is just, it is honestly a lot more weathered now. That was a few years ago. But um, the Sleepy Lagoon is a perfect example. This is what I want somebody to do if they have the wherewithal. I want somebody to go to Young Electric Sign Company or a similar company and I want them to pitch them on donating some time to harvest these signs. They need a crew, a truck, and a, you know, a welder and a cutter and stuff. And I can raise the money to go to the owners and give them like $1,000 or $2,000 for the sign. They're not using it because the motel's gone. And so then, this is the fun part. We find a place like the State Fair Park or the Sugar House Park and we do a public art installation of old motel signs. And they don't have to be maintained. They can just weather away and die. I don't care. It's just the idea <laughs> around the state. And we shouldn't be stingy. We should do one in like Beaver or St. George. You know, let them have an installation in their city park. Have you seen the one in Las Vegas? Yeah, the Neon Museum. But I don't want it to be a museum. I want it to be in a public park that people are using and that would just be like, oh yeah, and we have a little plaque that said, you know, this was a motel. I know, I'm crazy. I told Roger and he's like, oh, that's a whole other job. And <laughs> but I'm just telling you guys because you love history and it would be so fun. And these signs are going by the wayside. I mean, the scenic motel, if you've ever driven by that one on Foothill, it just got torn down a few years ago. And Susan and I were literally like, don't tear it down, just give it to us, we'll put it in our backyard. <laughs> and so they, I mean, I pretty much think every year we're losing two or three and there's only 35 left. It wouldn't be too hard. All right, the safari, it's beautiful, it's in Nephi. Um, that's another Patel owned motel that is really fun to visit. The Sleepy Hollow is in Green River. That one was very beautiful. I don't think the motel is still operating. The Fillmore. Hilarious guy, like ready to take a little sleep. And that one is owned by some immigrants from Guatemala. We met them. They were really fun and nice to talk to. The Starlight Motel was in Nephi. I'm so happy I took this picture because now it's painted over and it's somebody's dance studio. The sign's still there, but if you drive through, it won't look like this. But the motel was gone when I took the picture. I just took the picture because I love the sign. And the arrow is still there, and it points to a dance studio. So some of them are gone, and some of them are still there. Pillow Talk Motel. OK, I know this isn't like a super vintage one, but I just love that sign. And it does have a neon element at the top. And then Balance Rock is in price. So Pillow Talk is in Wellington. Balance Rock is in price. Balance Rock is a beautiful sign. It's got a 7-Up uh, logo on it. You don't see much anymore. 
and then robber's roost, Susan is convinced that this one is actually a bathing beauty and a pool, but they've painted over it to make it more modest and look like a, a cowboy with cowboy boots. So I loved it for that story alone. Um, so that's about it. I just wanted to finish by saying thank you for being interested. I wanted to pay tribute to my aunt who started the Millen Motel and several other businesses. And I have a couple times for questions if you want to ask me any questions. More to come? Yes. Got north much? Yes. We have, um, I've done Brigham City. Susan's done Logan. Uh, Roger told us about one in Tremont. And we've, Oh, we haven't done a good job in Ogden. That's probably our big blind spot right now. There's a, there's a great one in West 24th Street. That's, that's what I've heard. It's an old, uh, got the, 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 the garages. The garages. Oh, cool. Oh, good. Okay, so if anyone has any tips, my email is relentlesshistory at gmail.com. And so if you think as you're sitting here, well, she should talk to this person or she should drive by that, relentlesshistory at gmail.com. Uh, but we do have a master list and we're trying to accomplish every single town. Um, I think we're pretty much 80%. We've got to still do a really good job in Vernal. There's quite a few cool dinosaur motels out there that we've got to document. But they're going by the wayside. Other questions? Yes. So, um the Apache Hotel is listed on the National Register, and yeah. part of the significance was for the room that uh, John, John Wayne stayed, stayed there. there. Good, so it's legit. That's a real story. They yeah. Altered the roof on it. It's used to be flat. Yeah. Um, and then the, the Perry. The, the, yeah, the Perry the, in Canab. Yeah. The I have their sign up there over there. Yeah. yeah, the Perry is a really cool one where lots of people stayed. Famous uh, '50s actors when they were filming in Canab. So we were thrilled to find out that some of them were already on the National Register. Very exciting. The safari, it seems like they used to go on South University Avenue with Global Food. And it had a, like a fire stick. Yes. Like a, yes, we have the postcard, but we don't, the, the thing is long gone. All these guys are sitting by the off ramp in Salina. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've seen the sign down there in the gas station. OK. Good. Other questions? Yes. Is your you mentioned Edwin Anderson um, and some crafts in the work. I mean, some of the designs are quite spectacular. Mm -hmm. So does your research uncover who the architects are? <clears throat> Yeah, we've worked with Peter Goss a little bit. It's been a little hard to find the architects because some of them were the mom and pop ideas. And then Susan researched the Tourist Court Journal maps and the plans. And so we've been able to find that they didn't have an architect when they went that route. But certainly the ones in Salt Lake, like the Hotel Utah Motor Lodge, if you remember, it had those big boomerang, googie architecture kind of things. We're going to have as many as we can with architectural research because like you said, some of them are just phenomenal and unusual. We just happen on that, uh, that Coral Hills reference because the guy that runs the Whitworths now, he's very educated about pr protection and preservation and he had researched all of the properties. So I was excited. Not everyone cares about it. A question on the El Piso. Yes. Um, in the background. It looked like a pioneer era house. Yes. Was that integrated into the motel? Or it was. They wouldn't take it down because they wanted to leave it. It was very evocative of the pioneer era. And so they, they didn't rent it out or anything, but they just left it there and maintained it. Yeah. The Rugged West, which is my title slide. I don't know if it goes back to that. But it, um, it has the, the sheriff's office or like the jail from St. George and it's still there if you guys are in Ancestor Square in St. George you'll see it and it's um, so see there's the El Peso and it has that old building that's what he's talking about see that you'll see one on the Rugged West one too so when we do our thing at um, the State History Conference we're going to have a lot more pictures around so you guys are going to be able to see a lot more motels Maybe almost 100 if we can get them all put together. OK, so see that old house right there? It's still there on Ancestor Square. The rest of the place is gone. And on the bottom corner was uh, the Big Hand Cafe, if anyone remembers that cool sign. It was a big, huge black hand that hung down and pointed towards the
cafe my mom worked there when she was in high school. It was the bus stop for the Greyhound bus. So they would be able to, you know, have the Big Hen Cafe and then you could stay in the tourist court back there. And, oh, he tore it down. But anyway, yes? I stayed at the old Peso when I was in high school. Oh, you did? Good. So the, the bed, this would have been in 19... Probably 1973, 74. Mm -hmm. And the beds were like built in, like they had a box around them with this yeah. like curved wood. Yeah, the craftsmanship in there. I know. Huge room. Some of them have fireplaces even now. Yeah. And they did. They had some combed woodworking finishes. They had all that stone. Yeah, it was real amazing. I mean, I'm glad it's still there even in the condition it's in. But thank you for sharing that. That's great. Other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of motels that had a uh, service station out front or a mm -hmm. barbershop. Are there any other with crazy business <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting question. So the thing with the gas stations, it didn't last because it was not pleasant for the customers to have all that going on all night. <laughs> so that was a good idea that didn't really pan out. Um, the most common thing they added was swimming pools and that became kind of the big amenity. But in terms of other businesses, I, I can't think of a lot. I mean, usually these people did have another business in town, but it might not have been adjacent to their motel. Uh, cafes, there were a lot of those, and that's a common model. But um, I guess what I love about that part of it is just the creativity. You know, nowadays, if you wanted to do this, you go to your bank and you have to have a pro forma and you have to have it all, an SBA loan. And back then, they were just like on the back of a napkin. <laughs> and you know, now it's still around for us to enjoy. So, anyway, thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. Your interest.